In this video, we'll take a look at how the spirit of Antichrist is already in operation. We'll closely examine one of the most serious warnings that we've been given by Jesus Christ concerning the last days. But before we begin, I'd like to bring your attention to an article published by CBN. The headline read, The Satanic Temple Planning More After School Clubs in Response to Good News Clubs. Here's what the article says. In Memphis, Tennessee, controversy arose following the announcement by TST of its intention to start an after-school club for children aged from kindergarten through the fifth grade at a local school. June Everett, a minister at the Satanic Ministry and campaign director for the After School Satan Club, emphasized that the club's activities are benign. We're not sacrificing children or killing baby goats, Everett said in a video posted on the social media platform X. The club intends to teach children about nature and science, portraying Satan as a symbol of kindness and sharing. Let me just pause here for a second and highlight what is being said here versus what the Bible says. TST, the Satanic Temple, say they intend to portray Satan as a symbol of kindness and sharing. However, the Bible says Satan is the father of lies. The Bible says Satan's goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. The Bible says Satan prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And once again, TST want to portray Satan as a symbol of kindness and sharing. But the Bible says in Isaiah 5 verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now keep all of this in mind as we go back to the article. TST, which currently has 10 after-school clubs in six states, started these initiatives as a counter to the Child Evangelism Fellowship's CEF 3000 Good News Clubs in the U.S. and 80,000 worldwide. The mission of the Good News Clubs is to share the gospel with students after school. Recently, a Kansas school district approved the first high school Satan Club proposed by TST. While the initiative has been met with opposition, including a petition with over 8,000 signatures. The club has fulfilled all requirements for registration and is set to start meeting in the coming weeks. So let me ask, if the Temple of Satan is really something good and wholesome for children, why are they only targeting schools that have after-school clubs teaching about Jesus? Could it be that the devil is trying to establish these after-school programs simply to make a stand against Christianity? When the Bible tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, this is what we're seeing. This is how these battles manifest themselves. You are hardly ever going to look into the sky and have your spiritual eyes opened to such an extent where you see the battle between demons and angels taking place. That will most likely not happen. What will happen is that you'll begin to see strange things happen where good is now being called evil and evil is now being called good. Do you ever turn on the news or take a peek at your favorite online news outlets and think, what is going on? It seems that more and more lately, we find ourselves throwing our hands up in the air in response to where society is heading from our conservative, non-religious friends to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We all are in disbelief of how low morality has been sinking lately. Anyone with a shred of decency in them is starting to feel more and more out of place in the world today. Godly values, or any values for that matter, are being tossed out the window daily. We look around us at the people who seem to be okay with it all as we scream, don't you see what's happening? But the silence proves to us that few people actually care or see how we are approaching terribly wicked times. That apathy can sometimes make us think that we're the crazy ones. The Bible did tell us that the last days would be like the days of Noah. This pre-flood era is known for being violent and sinful. That is why God intervened and sent a global flood. Jesus, when speaking about his return, said, as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. 
Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 to 37 reads, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So how do we interpret what Jesus is saying here? How do we make it relevant in this day and age that we live in? Well, Noah was a righteous man. He was a righteous man living in a time when the world was filled with sin. Society had become perverse and wicked. People preferred to do things their own way, and evil was rampant in the hearts of many. Let me stop there and ask a few questions about this current day and age that we live in. Are we living in a time where the world is filled with sin? Has society become perverse and wicked? Do people prefer to do things their own way? And is there evil in this world today? As I continue, I want you to apply what the days of Noah were like and compare them to today. Now, before the flood and while Noah was building the ark, he spent years and years and years preaching to the people and no one responded. People ignored the warnings that God's judgment is coming. People ignored the calls to repent. Now, let me ask you, how many people can access the gospel today but choose not to? How many people hear the gospel today but choose to ignore it? I am sure that when Noah preached, and after some time when people didn't see the flood coming, I believe he would have been mocked by some, and persecuted even. Now in this day and age, are Christians being mocked? Are they being persecuted? We get another good insight into the sinful mind of man as we get closer to the return of Christ in 2 Peter chapter 3. From verse 1 to 3, the Bible says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. When people hear about God, the Bible, or wholesome and traditional values these days, what do they tend to do? You guessed it, scoff. Why do people scoff at the very principles that we hold dear? Is it because they would rather follow their own sinful desires than follow after Christ? The devil has people convinced, tricked, and absolutely hoodwinked today that their sin is good, and God is somehow bad. Most people don't even see that their sin is sin. Most people have been tricked into thinking that the sin which harms them is good for them. Furthermore, the devil has planted the lie in people's minds that God is some restrictive tyrant. What people do not understand is that it's not only the fact that God hates sin and that we should avoid it, it's also that those very sins people want to cling to are what destroy us in the end. The temple of Satan is not alone in this train of thought. All around the world today, society seems to be doing everything in its power to stand in the way of people learning about Christ. More and more we see society accepting and even promoting lifestyles, ideologies, and activities that are directly against God. Why does the Bible say in Proverbs 4, verse 23, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Look at that. The Bible says, above all else. Why? Why is it that the heart should be guarded so closely, so diligently? Well, I believe that Satan, the serpent of old, is after our hearts, especially in these last days. The plan of the enemy is to attack your heart. It's to infiltrate your heart so that you would be consumed with everything but God. The Bible tells us that the spirit of Antichrist is already in operation in this world. And think about that for a minute. There is so much deception today. Entertainment is deceiving, appearing to be good when there's an evil agenda. Music is deceiving. It's sounding good, but there is an evil agenda behind it. Some churches are deceiving. They have a form of godliness, but there is a subtle evil. And in these last days, you'll begin to see more and more mockers and scoffers of the gospel appear. 
2 Peter 3 from verse 4 says, They will say, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The Bible says that in the last days people will mock the return of Christ, as well as creation in general. People take for granted that God is long-suffering, and they think that because He won't return this very second and judge their wickedness, He either doesn't exist or doesn't care. In this portion of Scripture, the Bible tells us that they deliberately overlook the obvious works God has accomplished in nature. The handiwork of God is all around us in creation, and yet they choose to ignore it. Romans chapter 1 makes mention of this and tells us that people are without excuse, because even by looking around in nature, it is obvious that God exists and made the world. Also, there's evidence of a global flood, and they chose to ignore that also. In the name of science, society comes up with all kinds of bizarre teachings that are contrary to God and common sense. This is all done in an attempt to pretend He does not exist. People are going to continue standing against all that we believe in. There is no changing that. What we can do is realize what exactly is going on and wake up to the fact that sin is rampant in this world. And when we realize that, we must raise our banners high and sound the alarm. It is our duty as God's people to stand up to this wickedness around us. Stand firm on God's word. We live in a world whereby virtually everything is being watched. What you do online is being watched. Wherever you go, you're being watched. Where you spend your money, that's being watched. How fast you drive, that's being watched. There are cameras everywhere. Cameras that have facial recognition and can identify a person based on their biometric data. This is the world we live in. But on a deeper level, we are all being watched. And our audience is in heaven. Hebrews 12 verse 1 tells us that, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Did you get that? We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We have an audience in heaven watching us, watching what we do and what we don't do. They are watching where we go and where we don't go, how we use our time and what we do with our time. So now I'd like to tell you about the third group that is watching us. The first is this physical world. The second is the audience in heaven and the third is the underworld, the kingdom of darkness. Oh, if you didn't know, they are watching you too. The devil and his kingdom is watching us. Their intentions are evil. Their motives are to destroy. In fact, when you deconstruct 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, you will come to understand that we really are being watched because the Bible says, Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Other translations say he is looking for whom to devour. This means that we have eyes on us, eyes from the enemy. Now let me tell you the devil's strategy and what he does as he looks for someone to devour. He's looking to see if you earnestly believe what you say you believe in. He's looking to see whether you have a prayer life that's consistent. He's looking to see if the Word of God is really in your heart. He's looking to see if you are who you say you are. If you say you're a child of God, believe me, the devil will look at you. He will watch and study you to see whether or not you actually live like a Christ follower. 
Do you remember what the devil said when he approached God about Job? Job chapter 1 verse 9 and 10 says, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. How did the devil know that there was a hedge of protection around Job and his house and on all that he had? The devil was watching him. And in the same way that this world is watching what you do, where you browse, what you tweet and say, in the same way that cameras watch you, the enemy is running surveillance on us. I want you to notice how someone who has a weakness for a certain thing or a certain sin, the devil will never offer an alternative, no. The devil will offer an alcoholic alcohol. He will plant thoughts in their mind about alcohol. He will introduce them to people or so-called friends who will enable them to drink. The devil will focus on that one weakness but have various schemes to target an individual. In the same way, you will never find the devil to entice an adulterer or a fornicator with other sins like stealing or gossiping. No, the devil watches what you do in private, what you tolerate in private, what you entertain in private, and he will offer you just that. So we need to be careful. We need to be prayerful. This is why 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. In other words, be alert, be watchful, be well-balanced, be self-disciplined, and be cautious at all times. Why? Because the devil is looking. Now, I want to bring your attention to another audience that's watching you. And this is the most important set of eyes on you. Jesus Christ. Let me read you a couple of scriptures that you should hold closely to your heart. Luke chapter 8 verse 17 says, For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. We need to really grasp what the Bible is saying here because when it comes to the eyes of the Lord, nothing is hidden. Nothing is done in secret. Nothing is is done in the dark. He sees it all. When you're behind closed doors, God sees everything. Maybe your wife doesn't. Maybe your parents don't. You may hide it well from your kids, but it's never hidden from God. Revelation 20 verse 12, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Books were opened. There are books that I believe will contain our every deed, every thought and action. And unless we repent of all sinful ways, there will be a day where you and I will have to answer for our actions. The Bible tells us that we will be judged by what is written in the books and according to what we have done. So remember, the world is watching you. The enemy and his kingdom of darkness is watching you. But pay no mind to both of these groups because you need to only be concerned with Jesus Christ. He is watching you. So make sure he sees a believer who is obedient. Make sure that when the Lord looks at you, he sees someone who is dedicated and committed to the kingdom of God. Make sure that when the eyes of the Lord look at you, they see no bitterness, no unforgiveness, no malice or sexual immorality. Make sure that when they look at your heart, they see no pride, no jealousy or envy. But may they see a heart that has been transformed and renewed by the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you this. If you knew that everything you do, everything you said, every thought, action, and word would have to be accounted for, would you act different? Would you think different? You see, the book of Hebrews tells us that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. 
And that should make you think. What would that cloud of witnesses say about me? What would they say I did? Would they say that there was no doubt? No doubt at all that God was the center of my life. Would they say that I lived a life intent on seeking God? Would they say that they heard me wake up every day with praises on my mouth? That I never took life for granted and I was thankful for seeing a new day? Would they say that my prayer life was strong? My heart was a willing heart. I was humble. I forgave others and never kept a grudge. What would that cloud of witnesses say when I'm looking at eternity? Will they speak of me and say, he was only ever on his knees on a Sunday in a church with an audience. We never saw him pray behind closed doors alone unless he wanted something. We never saw him open God's word and meditate on it. We never saw him lift his hands and say thank you when he received a blessing. But we did see his eyes filled with greed and envy for worldly things. We did see that his heart was filled with jealousy and pride. We heard him putting other people down. We saw him walk with the wicked and judge other sinners. What would that cloud of witnesses say about you? About your walk with Christ? Your prayer life? Your belief? We need to have the presence of mind to know that what we do matters. Our daily decisions matter. So I pray that you live a guarded life. I pray that you guard your mind against negative seeds of thought. I pray that you guard your heart against envy, jealousy, and greed. I pray that you guard your eyes against the spirit of lust. I pray that the Holy Spirit will give you the strength to fight the good fight. And above all, I pray that God's grace is upon your life. Chase God and chase Him every day. Day.